Joel, just go on to bed without me. I want to do a little bit of journaling and, in this case, a little bit of a, a letter to my family back east. They have been waiting to hear from us, I'm sure, about our journey west. And I must instruct them on how things have gone so that you can post that in town tomorrow when you go. January 5th of 1854. Today, cold and windy. Not sure what kind of weather this new year will bring. I am hopeful that our cow, who just gave birth to a new heifer calf today, will bring us much, much luck. She sure is a pretty little thing. Hope she turns out to be quite a milker like her mother. I must quickly finish this journal. I am hoping to mail a letter to my family back east when Joel makes his trip tomorrow to town. Dearest family, January 5th of 1854, I hope this letter finds you all in good health. Joel, the children, and I are doing well. We made it to Oregon after five long months on the trail. Our overland journey started on the 9th of April as we said goodbye to our home of 16 years and headed for Council Bluffs. Here, thousands of pioneers have been in camp for weeks, preparing for their journey overland. Oh my! It was quite the experience to see all these people spread out across the land, just waiting for the chance to begin their journey west. We purchased some more supplies, making sure that we had everything we needed before jumping off and making our way to Oregon. Finally, in the first part of April, we got underway. The first portion of the journey was beautiful for there were countless acres of green grass and the most beautiful wildflowers that a girl has ever seen. The ground was so flat that you could see for miles and miles. As we traveled along, we kept close to the Platte River, which was nearly a mile wide at some points. It even had sandbars and some islands within it. It provided a fresh supply of water for us for hundreds of miles. Within several months, we had our first look at the majestic mountains that we would have to travel through. We also were able to travel along another river with delicious water to drink. Before too long, we found ourselves traveling along the South Pass, which led us alongside the Wind River Mountains. They sure looked a bit romantic, covered with snow as far as the eye could see. We found ourselves traveling along some dangerous terrain, one mountain after another, and rivers with fast-moving currents that made it impossible for us to cross. We just kept plodding along, day after day, night after night, getting even closer to this destination. And finally, I found myself alongside the Columbia River in Oregon Territory, where I gave birth to our eighth child, uh, a boy named Adam. Oh, before I crossed that mighty Columbia River. Eventually, Joel would, t would trade two yokes of oxen for our half section of land that had been planted with a half acre of potatoes and a small log cabin and a lean-to. This has become our new home, and we just celebrated our first Christmas in, in it by giving thanks to God for preserving us and this amazing journey west. Dears family, I am not sure if I will see you anytime soon, but please know that you were in our thoughts and prayers. The journey west was filled with many hardships and adventures, but we have persevered and are so happy to be settled in for the winter. God willing, our paths will cross again someday. But until then, I remain your loving Amelia. With love, Amelia Stewart Knight. So this is just one of the many ways in which I bring um, the Oregon Trail to life by role playing as you have seen me do with Miss Amelia Knight Stewart. Um, and I will show you that I also role play another figure in my Westward Expansion unit a little bit later on when you come visit me at the, at the station work here. But Amelia is just one of the, the many figures. Um, so, she and her family, if you don't know the end of her, her journey, would settle in what was called Clark County here. Ah, there we go. Clark County, and then that would become um, part of the city of Vancouver and eventually Washington Territory. 
she would actually give birth to yet one more child uh, while there, so that would make nine, and then she would pass away after living a long life in January 25th of 1896 at the age of 79. So a remarkable story. When I was researching her, I was just amazed at the perseverance, but yet positive attitude she had all the way going through that journey. She was one of the journalists that did write just about every day. Um, so that really made her struggle, her life come to life for me. So it was really quite something to read um, and study. So, a little bit about me, as you heard Helen mention, uh, from that good non-trail state, Wisconsin, way over there, uh, but certainly have loved learning about the trails, and so today, my hope is to present to you a good overview of what I do when I teach the Westward Expansion um, to my eighth graders here, in usually the spring of the year. So it's perfect timing for jumping off and all that. So I hope to give you an overview of uh, the kinds of different activities that I teach throughout the course. So I'll use my handout that I have here to reference a few things as well. Um, go through a little bit about my lessons. Um, go through the role playing that the kids do eventually to the assessment that they create um, before I actually then show you uh, one of the assessments as well. So again, hopefully there will be some time at the end for some questions too. All right, so what has been my inspiration for traveling? Many people ask me that, how do you love history so much? What is it that really has inspired you? Well, it goes back to my earliest of years. To be honest with you, I have had parents who were both teachers. One of them is sitting over there, Rudy. Uh, many of you have had the opportunity to meet him. Uh, they always wanted to take us as kids um, on a vacation every summer. Being both of them teachers, we had the summers off. So we were able to literally plan out a trip um, and try to see the United States in whatever direction it took us. So many of you, I'm sure, perhaps, can relate to this. The road trips, right? Okay. And maybe even to this movie. All right, so that was the classic movie, and as soon as I saw that when it came out, I was like, oh my goodness, that is our family vacation. That is really what it was all about, because my parents, they planned it down to the day. They had us going here, there, and everywhere on a day-to-day -day, um, event. So here are just some of the reminiscences of my childhood. See if you recognize any of these places. There's the family truckster. And the good old pull-behind camper there as we traveled from one place to another. Ah, there was my first experience in a covered wagon. Ah, here we are at the Grand Canyon enjoying a picnic lunch. And doing a little horseback riding with Dad and my sisters. Ah, now this is my mother was an excellent seamstress, so she was already sewing those outfits that everybody could easily recognize us all being dressed alike. Um, and then you can see I had an early love of dressing up. There is one of my earliest of costumes, the bicentennial year um, in 1976. Now we got over to Salem, uh, Massachusetts, and so parents decided, wow, let's give the kids a time in the stocks and let go and tour the rest of the places and see if they, you know, cry for us later on. So we were left there for a little while, wondering when mom and dad were going to come back and get us. But uh, that was the punishment of the past. And there we are in Natchez, Mississippi, touring the uh, Civil War homes there that that city has an abundance of. And a picnic lunch there. Now notice the teenager in me is starting to pull out that I don't want to be photographed. That is me on the far end. Don't photograph me. I am a teenager now. I'm too cool for this. Um, so that is a little bit. So my parents I am very grateful for because they made all those trips possible with a very little budget, but it was so much fun to, to see the West and to see all over this great country. So. Looking at our trails west and teaching you a little bit about it, I'd like you to turn to the handout that hopefully you received at the door, just to show you a little bit of what I do. Um, so, it looks like this. And as I explain things, hopefully it'll become a little bit more clear um, as I go through it, so you can kind of see it up close. Sometimes it's hard to see on the screen. So this is a look at my, some of the activities I do, from a picture analysis on that first page, to a look at a supply list. 
um, creation of a supply list that the students of mine will do with a list of supplies and their bulk weight units and prices, which is important. This is a map of uh, the Oregon Trail made by Bridger, which is who I play um, for also part of this role. And if you take a look then, you'll also see at the very last couple pages here, I create a pioneer project. That's the assessment that I have for the westward expansion um, that shows you a little bit about the rubric and also um, the actual directions for that. So contact information on the back if you need anything, please don't hesitate. But now moving into the background here of what I do. So I begin with a picture analysis. And like I tell my students, that pictures tell a thousand words. Um, I really want them to learn from pictures. So the first picture I present in the Westward Expansion is this one. And what I do is I tell my kids, now look at this closely. Yeah, you can look at it the first time, but really study it. Really see if you can see all the detail there. Uh, now all of us know that this is a, a portrait called American Progress by John Gast. Um, who created this to really represent Manifest Destiny. And so, I want the kids then to give this picture a title and a quick description. If they were to describe this in one sentence, what would they say about this picture? And then, I have them make some observations. Now I say, look closely and examine this. What do you notice that is very unique to this picture? And you can start to see a lot of unique detail, like the angelic figure there holding a telegraph line in one hand. Many of us maybe wouldn't have seen that if we hadn't necessarily had that pointed out right there. Um, or the book of knowledge that she has. Or maybe why the sky is dark in one side of the picture and lighter in the other. What is that symbolic of? Then I have them write down questions. If they were to hear and understand the story of this, this picture, what would they have to know? What would they have to ask to, to find out about it? And so, they then write a list of, of series of questions. Like, of course, you're going to have the standard ones like, who, who painted this picture? Or, you know, what are, they, what are the miners doing in this picture? Or things like that. And then, ultimately, what I do, because social studies is all about inquiry, I want them to be curious. And this is what helps them to become curious. I want them to ask questions. And so what I send them in is I tell them finally what the name of this portrait is. I say it's called American Progress. And I send them on a 10, 5 to 10 minute Google search. I want them to answer the questions now in their own way. And report back to me at the end and to their classmates on what they have found out about this picture. So that's how we kind of begin a unit of study, and that's how that picture analysis piece works. Then, of course, we talk a little bit about why people move. And we call these factors push and pull factors. So when people decide to leave a place, what's pushing them out of their home? Why would anybody want to move? What would pull people to a certain area of the world? And so we take a look at the, obviously, the excitement of owning your own land for the first time ever in your lifetime. We talk about that feeling of adventure. We talk about that California gold rush that brought an immense people, immense amount of people there. And all the reasons for why people would want to move uh, and resettle themselves in the West. I then have students begin to take a look at the country. They can't really understand it until they actually have mapped it out themselves. So there is a mapping assignment where I have them become the cartographers and map out the West using themselves a series of maps that I usually will present to them and also have them search up some of these being the case. Now eventually that leads me to this map, which I actually then created. Um, this is actually the character I play, Bridger. And this is a map that if you can imagine now, it's gonna be blown up into a poster size map in my classroom. And as you may have guessed, all my students become pioneers for this unit. So all of them are gonna be role playing. All of them are gonna be working as teams, wagon train teams, to move themselves west and to try to get to Oregon first. So it's a bit of a competition. I have a little co competitive spirit in me, so I bring out the competition a little bit with the kids a little bit more. So when it comes time, they all have to then travel the trail as a group. Now how they travel the trail 
is they create a wagon train um, team name and a team model, and then they create like a little tiny wagon. Looks like this, and you'll see some of these on my table um, later on. And what they do is if you can look at this closely, you're going to see that there are dots here on the trail. So this is independence down here. I know it's really a lot to look at. But there are dots here, and each dot signifies a move. So the wagons have to have a, a pr profound tongue that sticks out because that tongue then points to the moves as they move on the game board and travel the trail, okay? Now each one of those dots signifies about 20 miles on the trail, and so they are trying to make as many moves, that's what the goal is, as possible. Now you might be thinking, well, how do they get their moves, right? How do they gain moves? Well, it is doing their chores, putting that team effort to get their chores done every day, um, to cooperation, and then working together as a team and answering questions and being active learners. So all those things every day are compounded into daily moves. And so they're obviously trying to get across the trails to obviously if they're going to Oregon, up here to Oregon City, or down here to Sutter's Fort in California. So again, that's a, about as, as accurate as I can get and just hand drawing that map there for you. And there's a picture of it in there. Now, in addition to that, they have to make trail moves and the decisions just like the pioneers did. So they have to cross rivers. They have to make trail decisions. They have to decide on passes. All those things that you see pretty much on there. And now leads me to my second role, Mr. Jim Bridger. Nice to meet you all. And now, if you didn't know about Jim Bridger, he's from the South, in Virginia, in fact. And so I come in with a little bit of accent and really uh, get into that and play in that role as well. So, Mr. Bridger, I introduce myself as a trail boss. And so as I guide my pioneers west now, I get into that role and tell them a little bit about myself. So many of you are familiar with Mr. Bridger, who in fact did own a fort uh, with his partner here in the west, but did start his life as a guide, a explorer, trapper, a blacksmith, etc. So he was a well-diversified man. And so I tell my students a little bit about myself. I also tell them that I had a kind of wicked sense of humor and liked to play some practical jokes on my pioneers a time or two when traveling the trail. So just be aware of that, pioneers, as we, as we go. And never know if I'm kidding you or joshing you a little bit or whether I'm telling the truth sometimes, but just be aware to double check those facts a little bit. So I tell them about myself and then we go into creating the wagon train teams. So now, how they do that is I have my class set up into like four different wagon trains. The actual desks looked to be in wagon train kind of gr group formations. And then in this case, they also um, kind of had to pick a pioneer identity. So, first of all, we take a look at their responsibilities. Their responsibilities are to create a team diary slash journal. So they identify with about seven of them, usually in a wagon train group, who's going to be their wagon master, who's going to be their journalist, who's going to be in charge of the supplies, and all the things that are needed to kind of make their team run as smoothly as possible. They identify with a, a team name now. So this, this one's called the Willard Wagon for some reason. Um, and they usually have a team color as well. So this one would be the green that you see kind of reflected in the, the journal background there. Um, then, interesting enough, they have to have a team model, something that inspires them to keep going west and uh, give them that motivation to continue. And then, as we go into the journal itself, you're going to see that they have to introduce themselves, who they all are, what they're, why they're going west, tell us a little bit about that. And then as they travel the trail each day, they begin to fill out this journal just like the diarists would have been doing. So, what happened on day one? What occurred? And so they're writing about that. Most importantly, from the teacher's perspective, I'm also seeing how well they're cooperating. So what, what did you think of your team cooperation today? Was there any problems with any of the pioneers? Or were, was everybody doing what they needed to do to get the job done? So those are some of the things that you see there being written down. And then there's a little bit of what's called a daily cooperation grade. So I'm kind of watching the groups as they're working and, and, and things like that, and then that is graded also every day for them. And then that's turned into those moves that I was talking about before on the game map as well. That helps to create those moves. Then, this is a wagon train folder where they keep all their supplies. So each team has a folder that they pick up when they come in the door and they see here how many moves they earn from day to day. 
So if you take a look at this, this was the smoke and bacon wagon, um, they called themselves, and a little bit of their, their graphics on their, their wagon train folder there. And then inside of the folder, as you, whoops, as you can probably see here, maybe a little bit, there are the team names with uh, the chores of the day and filling that all in here, to equivalent down here to the moves that the team made from, from day to day. And that's what kind of moves them along that trail that I was telling you about before. Here's another cute little wagon train folder there, the prairie dogs. It's fun to see what they come up with. They come up with all kinds of really fun, creative things. All right. So basically then, they role play a pretty authentic pioneer. Now, basically there is this um, simulation that kind of has been created that I use some of their resources for. And I don't know if you can see this from where you're at, but, whoops, keep moving the wrong one there. Uh, if you take a look up here, this is a list of pioneers and pretty authentic. These are all fictional characters, but they could actually be real if they needed to be. So um, all these pioneers are people that literally could have lived back in the day. They have a name. They sometimes have a family, depending on if they, what their occupation is sometimes. It tells you their occupation up here. It tells you um, where they're coming from. It tells you if they're bringing any oxen or cattle or anything like that with them. And so they have, out of the seven pioneers in a wagon train group, they have about nine identities they can pick from as a team. So basically then they identify, they create what's called a roll card here, which is what you see over here. So Alan Shepard, Nate Page, the blacksmith, um, and they all in this case then travel with these cards and that's what I call them. As soon as they get their pioneer identity, it's no longer Michael or Jack or whatever. It's, hey Mr. Shepard, nice of you to join us today. Come on in, have a seat. All right, and that's how I address them all as they, as they come on in and play out the, the roles with me. All right, so I do do a couple of mini lessons. Um, I call them campfire chats. They are kind of like the teacher-directed lesson. Um, so I actually have a homemade, not real fire, but a campfire in the middle of my room that's been made for me by somebody. And we all gather by the campfire to, in this case, uh, uh, hear the lesson of the day. All right, they come with their journals, they come with their, their pencils or pens, and they sit relaxed and we talk uh, about what we're gonna learn. So of course I begin with telling them a little bit about the trail and when we're jumping off as a wagon train. So I talk about the dates and I talk about the 1843 date and that we're waiting right now for the grass to be green before we get off on the trail. And then of course we have to go through some historical vocabulary to make sure that they know what we're talking about. So we talk about the word emigrant, talk about the migration, uh, look at some of the push-pull factors, look at cholera being one of the, the dreaded diseases, etc. Just to name a few things there that we will look at as a class. Sometimes they even show videos of cholera, which really grosses them out. They, they, they are intrigued by that most of the time, but um, they also love that. Um, in this case, we then talk a little bit about the trail itself. So we talk about how it's 2,000 miles long, where it begins, where it ends. Um, Again, I'll go through these pretty quickly. We talk about how most of these people walk that distance um, and how the death was pretty likely to see um, as they traveled the trail um, and the kinds of deaths that people had back in the day. They're very surprised because unfortunately, there's been a lot of myths out there that Native Americans were, of course, the, the big, unfortunately, um, killer of people in the tribe. And I try to say that that's definitely not the truth. That's a huge myth. Um, but well, there's a lot of accidents, a lot of diseases, and we talk about that um, as to what was the main cause of death on the trail. And of course we mentioned the first of the pioneers to travel, these missionaries that went to the Oregon Territory and Christianizing the natives there. And then we talk a little bit about um, the greatest migration, which was that thousand wagon train. Uh, and looking at the trail, I don't know how they ever had that be possible, <laughs> traveling the trail with a thousand wagons, but somehow that was the great migration of 1843. And then we talk, of course, about supplies. Now our starting point is in independence, and we literally now are spending some time in independence looking it over, shopping around, and outfitting our wagons for, for moving. So we talk a little bit about that city. 
And then we get into talking about the types of wagons to take. So we, we mentioned the Conestoga, we mentioned the Prairie Schooner, we talk about the benefits of both. Most of the kids will choose the Prairie Schooner, obviously, um, to go west with. And then they have to equip their supplies. So once more, they're talked about how they have only a thousand pounds of, of items they can put into that wagon. They have a budget they have to work with, which is why if you take a look at your, your handout there, you'll see that there's a price and a weight that is on there as well. So they have to be under a thousand pounds of weight and they can't spend more than a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars in their budget, okay? Um, as I tell them, it's always nice to have money for the rest of the trail. So don't go out and spend it all on in independence. And do realize that the more you get on the trail, the more expensive things are gonna be, right? So all of that is kind of discussed in uh, the purchasing of the supplies. And of course, as Bridger, I have a few recommendations for them about what to bring along on the trail. Um, rope, of course, being important. Uh, food enough per uh, family member there. I talk about making sure they have protection on the trails, if you know what I mean. And then I also talk a little bit about my favorite, how I cannot be on the trail without a huge supply of bacon and a whole lot of coffee. So we talk about that. Uh, and then we, in this case, get going here as um, now the pioneers begin to fill out their supply list. I myself go around and then I'll, I'll make notes or comment on them, check their weights and all things that a trail boss would do just to make sure they're all ready to head off and get on the trail with me on the day that we jump off. All right, and here is kind of like a sample lesson plan I'm going to show you. So this kind of shows you kind of what I do every day. Um, if you were one of my students. So you come in today and this is kind of what you'd see on the screen. Um, now as many of you may have heard me talk, I've actually had the chance to visit on the trails and to see the trails firsthand. So that's what helps me to really bring it alive is to tell the stories, to actually see seen the sites, to have actually walked those places. And that I think really helps people to understand what it was like too. Um, I'm also a teacher of life skills. So in addition to um, teaching history, I'm constantly looking at what my students can learn about becoming a better person, a stronger person. So that teaches, I'm also a teacher of leadership. Um, so for them, there's this man by the name of John Maxwell who I, who I use a lot. He has these little clips called Minute with Maxwell. And I will a lot of times talk about words like endurance. Why is endurance important when becoming a leader? And so I bring his little clips and talk about, it, especially as it relates to the pioneers, why would have endurance been important? Why would people have had, had that as a characteristic? Um, and so we talk a little bit about that at the opening of the lesson. Then I, just like I did with you, give them an overview. It's always, kids always want to know what we're doing every day and what the expectations are. Like, this is what we want to cover, here's where we're going, here's what the chore is. Now, chore for me is another name for homework. Okay, and yes, I am a teacher that gives pretty much homework every day. Now that is a strange thing um, in today's education system, I have to say, at least in the public level schools. Kids are not getting the homework that a lot of us get um, or are used to having grown up, but for me, they do. So even right now, sitting in school, um, it's an adjustment coming into my class right now because it's not like they're, they're getting busy work, but it's very particular to what we're studying and I need them to start it in school and be able to go home and finish it at night. So we usually give them that the next day. Now, I love jokes, even when they're corny like this one, and I love history trivia. So a lot of times my history trivia comes back from what we learned the day before, something related to what we're studying, uh, and then I'll throw in one of those corny jokes. So let's see how you guys do with this all, pioneers over there. Ah, why do melons have big weddings, I ask you. Anyone? Yes! Excellent, Pioneer. Wonderful. So they can't elope, she says. Great. Now let's see how well you were listening, Pioneers. What was the most significant supply for Mr. Bridger to bring along on his supply list that I couldn't travel the trails without? Lovely. Great job listening. Great job. All right. Good work. And then I also have them create 
uh, what are called lap books. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is really a nice graphic organizer uh, for how to, in this case, keep track of all the notes that they're taking related to the topics that we're studying. So this allows them to lay something out that's very uh, concrete, but also a very graphic organizer. Now, besides teaching the trails, which is what I do a lot of, I also have to teach about the Western expansion as a whole. So in my lessons on the Western expansion, I include the Texas Revolution, the Mexican-American War, um, the California Gold Rush, obviously, and then the, and the Native Americans and their relocation. So all of those things are embined in my campfire chats, um, wherever I can find them throughout that course of that unit. And then, as you may have mentioned, I uh, had the chance to visit the trail. So now, in this particular lesson, I'm actually going to take the kids on the trail, okay, via what I've learned and what I've seen myself firsthand. Many of you guys, because you're experts on this, will know this right off the get-go. So here we're going to start in Independence, and we're going to take you on the trails. So I start with that, talk a little bit about the city of Independence. And this wonderful, I don't know if you have had a chance to visit Independence and see Ralph here. Ralph is a, a, the person that takes everybody on those fantastic, uh, nice little mule rides through town. It's a historic uh, Independence. You can take the hour-long version, which is what my dad and I did. And I uh, really enjoyed learning about Independence there in the summer of 2017. There's Ralph and I. All right, maybe remember this Sadie. Uh, which was also a mail Pony Express, mail riders um, in this case, stop as well on the trail. Most of my kids have never seen a Sadi, so to show them what that was and talk about that is, is, is pretty amazing. Uh, many of you maybe recognize this. This is at Windless Hill, uh, where the windless crank was used to crank down those, those wagons. Um, we show the kids different angles of this hill and, and show them the windless crank so they can see how that was done, understand how that was done, see the ruts that that left. But like I said to them, the good thing is, is if they made it down, what was waiting for them was Ash Hollow at the bottom there, where they encamped and did some fishing and relaxed and, and just took it easy for a couple days. All right, all of us are familiar with this landmark here, which is, of course, what the pioneers were looking to see. They'd heard a lot about this in the journals, so Chimney Rock here. And then, maybe some of you recognize this. This is Fort Laramie. Uh, we had a gussie up to the bar there, have ourselves a sarsaparilla, because that's all we could have at that point in time. And there's Dad enjoying his. And then we had to talk to the young lieutenant here about how the cavalry was doing uh, on Fort Laramie that day, what was new with them. Um, then we went from there, obviously, and talked a little bit about these ruts being the most significant um, on the trail here, uh, just uh, upside of a register rock, the Guernsey, Guernsey ruts, and then this register rock and, and showing them how, yet even today, how clear the register is of all those names and dates and, and how they left their mark there in history, which is pretty amazing to see yet. That leads me to talk a little bit about the Platte River, which is the river that they followed most of the way through Nebraska and into Wyoming, of course, and talk about how they never f went far from the river. They kept the river in eyesight. Uh, that was the lifeblood for these pioneers traveling, and we talk about that significance. And then we registered talking about Independence Rock here and how these pioneers had to make it, if to be on time, by July 4th. Uh, before getting over the Rockies and being able to do that all. So we talk about all these landmarks along the way and their significance to the pioneers as they traveled on the trail. South Pass then, of course, the unbelievable pass to these mountains, which the pioneers really couldn't believe when they got there. Uh, and seeing that myself was pretty amazing. And that leads us down to Fort Bridger which, of course, uh, was something I was very interested in seeing firsthand to be able to tell the kids more about that particular fort and its importance. And, of course, from there to Soda Springs, which was something, again, of a, a luxury for the pioneers to stop, camp, enjoy some freshwater springs. Now, it was interesting when we tasted that. Uh, I, I definitely felt like, wow, that is like seltzer water. Um, <laughs> so I had to bring home a little bit uh, in a bottle or two and at least show the kids what that looks like there. And that leads us to the Dallas, which was where the pioneers, of course, had to make the decision to go overland or, or go on the Columbia at this point in time, a tough decision. Um, we talk about that and how many of them, that was a, a hard decision to make. Uh, this was the alternative to traveling the river, the Bartler Tow Roll. And then I do talk a little bit about some of the misbehaviors on the, on the trail. 
like the boot treatment here. So if you were a criminal, I don't know if you heard the story, um, you had a lot of the pioneer wagon trains or the trail boss would put you in a boot type device, except this boot was like almost 20 pounds. So it made it impossible for people to escape because it strapped onto your leg, they had a key on the lock, and so it made it really difficult to move around. Now, I obviously had to try that to see what it was like. Couldn't lift my foot up to even take a step. Um, so it was uh, worthwhile, I guess, to make sure that you had that for anybody that cri uh, had criminal activity as part of the train. All right, eventually we moved to Oregon City. And there's Dad and I as we have traveled now all the way to there. Enjoying the sights, going to the land office, and in this case registering for our land claim as to where we're going to have that there. And don't they look happy? They've made it. Woo, look at that. At the end of the trail. And there's that beautiful valley that awaits for them. All right. Now, I do talk about river crossings. And if I see you at the station later on, I might just have to have you for the river with me as Jim Bridger. So here's what happens. We talk about river crossings being one of the most... Uh, dangerous aspects of the pioneers, I would say, the thing they look forward to least. And so we talk about a lot of times the river conditions were really important to deciding which way they were going to cross. We talk about all three ways, such as fording the river and what that was like for the pioneers. We talk about caulking uh, their wagons and in this case making sure they had enough rope to get across that way. And then once in a while if they were lucky they might have a ferry that could ferry them across for a little extra money. And that's why that's important to make sure you got a little extra saved up there that you didn't spend your whole budget in independence. So that is a little bit of what we talk about and I actually had them simulate that. So once they decide we're up to a river they actually have to determine after they hear the, the scout's report that I bring in. Um, usually it looks like this. And I will demonstrate this to you all at my station here this afternoon. I usually get on my scout report and with an official voice I read what's happening with the river. Like right now this Platte River is five feet deep. The current's running pretty strong and if we angle it right here, by golly, I think my scout said we can probably ford the river. So who's with me? Are we going to ford it? Are we going to cock it? Gee, if you want to take a ferry, you have to go up the river a bit. That's going to cost you a few days and a few dollars. Uh, so you have to decide. So they, they make all those decisions and basically uh, have some fun with that. And then we actually cross the river. They actually have fates that play out. If things don't go quite right, um, they lose people, they lose um, possible their wagons, all those things that really did happen actually will play out for some unfortunate people in wagon trains. So we make it as realistic as possible. I also have them learning about the westward expansion and especially the trails by reading articles. These are very short um, but very concise in the information that the kids are getting um, just to give them a little bit more background of things that we're talking about. And what does the winning team get? Because we do kind of make this a little comp competition between all the teams. Oregon allows a team to get a certificate for some land. Yeah, they're like, okay, my, Mr. Bridger, that's awesome. But this is what they really like. The chore coupon, which gets them out of a homework assignment any time in the year. And they're like, yes, we want that. <laughs> so they're going to it. So um, other authentic uh, resources that I use, I also do uh, a read aloud. Um, this is the uh, series I usually choose. This is a young gal. This is a, non, or a fictional text, but it's set to be uh, historical fiction. So it's very accurate um, to what is happening on the day-to-day -day accounts of journals. So I will read my students um, a little bit of this from day-to-day. -day. Um, and so, as they're reading, I have them create what's called a graffiti wall. And a graffiti wall allows the kids, as they're hearing, to do something with what they're hearing to remember it by. So the first thing they're doing is they're creating a kind of a visual. As they're hearing about this young lady and where she's leaving from, they're kind of drawing things out. So it kind of sticks with them a little bit. And then, over there, they're kind of writing down what I call authentic details. Like when they're talking about, you know, supplies. Or when they're talking about where they're going. You know, when they hear some authentic sounding things, they write it down. Now, that helps them in their final assessment. All these things now are going to help them in the creating of their project here that's coming to a closure here. So for them, 
here's a couple of the pictures I also will show. So I kind of create slideshows with what I'm talking about in the book so they can kind of visually see it. I'm a very visual learner. You probably have uh, probably noticed that about me. <laughs> so I try to make the visual learning come alive too besides hearing it for, for the kids. And then this leads us to our assessments, which are really fun. Um, so for them now, with all the things that they've been learning, they've been taking notes, they've been doing this, they've been asking questions, etc. They have to create a project of some type that shows me that they can explain the, the Western expansion, especially the Oregon Trail, in a very authentic way. So some of them have created a, a diary, if you will. Some of them have created a, a booklet. Um, see, I will have quite a few, I believe, down by my station, so please stop down later on. I don't have any right up here with me. Um, some of them did videos, and then some of them will do slideshows, etc. So today, if all goes well on the sound now, I'm going to show you during COVID, it was a really testing time for, for teachers. Um, one, almost overnight, we had to learn technology we had never learned before. Um, kids, too. I uh, had, to, had to be able to get online, learn from us online. So it was a really trying time for many of us. Um, but those kids, just like the pioneers did, I, I even call them pioneers, you are the pioneers of virtual learning. You're doing something that we never thought we'd have to do. And so I'm along with you there, experiencing this for the first time, but they came through in just flying colors. They were able to, to put things together that were just unbelievable. So I think you'll be very proud of, of these kids and the kind of work that they did here as we, as we show you a little bit of their, their product here. So um, I think they'll make this slideshow available to you because there's several projects on here. I'm probably not going to be able to show them all to you, but they will be available on the slideshow. So if you click on any of these links, this young lady decided to do hers in a video. Ah. Well, let's see if we can get this in quick. Oop, no. Come on now. Oh, technology, you gotta love it. Here we go. Hopefully, we'll show it. And if not, we have another one we'll get to. All right, well, maybe it won't go through. We'll see it here. In which case, um, it should be available for you, and hopefully you can see it online, if nothing else here. All right. Okay, so just to show you a little bit then, um, I'll show you a slide, a slide um, project here real quick to give you a sense of what they did. This young man did a... a a nice job with his young fellow there that moves to Oregon. But here is one. They call it, they have to come up with a title. Some of them are really creative and a kind of title page here. So this young man did a slideshow and here is his family. So he has to show authentically a little bit of an artist here too. What, who's all part of his family. So it's his wife, his youngest son. And then he has to write journals. So if you look at, pay attention to the wording there, you're going to see him talking about very authentic day-to-day -day type things that pioneers would do, like collecting berries, you see there, um, talking about particular landmarks on the trail, talking about surviving, um, you know, all those things that are, that are definitely very authentic. I can see he knows what he's talking about by the way in which he writes his journal. They have to come up with a supply list. So a very authentic one. They have to actually map out their own creation of a map. So again, whatever they're talking about in their journals, they're actually showing on their map. So if they mention independence, they should have an independence, you know, where they're writing about independence as significance to the pioneers. If they're talking about Chimney Rock or, you know, um, Alcohol Springs or whatever it might be that they're bringing that alive in their journal so I can see that they really understand the map and the geography of the land as it relates to their journal. Another one now. I get a kick out of this because I use all kinds of vocabulary um, with the kids that are very authentic to the time period. So I'm saying things like, by golly, and you know, all this green horns and you know, things like this. So it's really fun for me to see that they also include this. So this is quite cute, this sentence here. The wagon is rickety and bumpy, and we sure are not having a hog killing time. Okay, so uh, very authentic to that time period, right? 
And then they have to write at the end a letter home. And after they've traveled the trails, they have to decide, would they recommend this trip to their family back home? And then why? And be able to talk about the reasons why they would not or would recommend this adventure. Now, th final thoughts about the trail and teaching the trail. It's my favorite unit. I teach um, American History Part 2. So my history class begins right now. In fact, they're, they're at the Constitutional Convention right now, playing delegates and founding fathers. I'm playing Washington over there, but my, my guest teacher is in place for me. But in this case, we take them from a review of the American Revolution all the way through the Civil War. So I have um, students for about 15 days in a rotation. And so what I have is 15 days to put a unit together in 90 minutes per day for my, for my black classes. Um, so I teach three blocks of social studies every day um, at 90 minutes apiece. And so when I see them, I have to really try to get as much across as possible. So for them, I try to role play. I have them role play. So all of them right now are founding fathers. In this unit, they're all pioneers. And I really think that helps to bring it alive. When you can have them playing people, be it real or people that could have been real, and having them go and, and do the things that we're asking them to do and simulate different activities, that really brings it alive. So in every unit that I do, I try to have that happen, which I think really makes it memorable for those students. Um, so that's my hope and goal as I move through here. These are the, the, the scrapbooks that you can see a little bit later on on my table if you come by my station. I would like to tell you also how I was connected to ACTA, to just take a moment to do that. So I was um, given the, the okay to go down to the National Social Studies Convention in Chicago, Illinois, which is the closest one that's been there for a while. And I was going through all the booths, checking out you know, the free stuff and all the good stuff that teachers can get a hold of and, and use, and who should I see there? But this cowboy, with a cowboy hat, kind of a western looking outfit, kind of reminded me of myself. So I'm like, wow, look at that. And then I saw all these intriguing maps and all this stuff on the west. And I said, well, I'm going to have to go over there and check that out. And who should be there but his sidekick, Mr. Travis, doing his computer stuff. And I said, wow, I'm Jill and I teach the western expansion. Looks like you have some very neat things I'd be interested in. And so I got talking to them, and that's where that educator kind of award came up. They said they heard about what I was doing. They said, I think you should do that. I think you should go for that. And so I did. And so that's how I came to be in Santa Fe two years ago and how I'm standing here today um, in front of you all. So now, as far as special thanks today, I really have to recognize um, God obviously making all this possible for me. Uh, my family back home, there's Packer fans that we are. Ah, you're right. I have three adult um, daughters and a husband that I just celebrated my 30th uh, anniversary with uh, not long ago. So I'm really blessed that way. Uh, they are stay keeping the home front going there for me. Um, Octa for this, this, these opportunities to be here today and to learn about the trail, especially the California Trail this time around, the Santa Fe Trail last time. Uh, my district for allowing me uh, twice now to come out for the entire week to, to experience this and be a part of this all and to learn from all of you. Um, my students, remarkable young people I have, who really um, love, I think that I'm passionate about it, but also just come through with fine colors. I mean, even, even the kids that sometimes struggle, you know, believing in them that they can do it. They have to work a little harder maybe, but they can do it.